Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything else to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Join us and our special guests as we continue the 25th anniversary celebrations of Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. I'm Nelson Aspen and you are back for another edition of Titanic Talk with my charming co-host Alexandra Boyd, who happens to know a thing or two about not only the steamship Titanic, but uh, the James Cameron film of the same name in which she appeared. And now she has a new documentary, Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries. She's the uh, producer, writer, director, uh, filmmaker, and kind of the narrator of this beautiful piece of art. And it features a lot of her Titanic co-stars reminiscing through their actual diaries of their life on the set uh, down in Rosarito, uh, Rosarito, Mexico, when they were filming Titanic. And today we're joined by one of her co-stars, uh, Liam Tui, who is notorious for being the last man off the ship. Uh, Jack and Rose may have been sucked under to the icy depths, but the baker just seemed to step right off the back and, and Liam played that baker. Now, Liam, please uh, tell us the correct pronunciation of said baker. It's Chief Baker Jochen. Jochen, and how do you spell that? Because it's, it's unless you know how to pronounce it, you're never gonna get it. Oh, I actually spell it, do I? J-O-U-G-H-I-N. <laughs> that's correct, Alexandra, yes. you would know yeah, all these I, I, that's, I'd have gone for J O U. G H I N, yes. That is exactly. Yeah. Uh, born, I believe, in the Isle of Man and grew up somewhere around the, the Liverpool area. And tell me about the first time you remember meeting Alexandra on the set. Oh dear. Oh, that was. That was in uh, our f five, our so called five to seven drinky pools, which extended into beyond midnight in the Real Del Mar Hotel. Yes, it was supposed to be just a two hour break away from filming and all that sort of thing. But um, the barman that was in charge kindly extended it every single night. And um, it was, a, it was behold, an eight hour, two hour happy hour. That was it, <laughs> <laughs> precisely. Uh, so we were on call quite a lot, as you can imagine with a shoot that, that large. And um, so we, we would be just sitting around the, the lounge talking and playing cards or whatever and having fun. And that's exactly where I met Alexandra and all the other co-stars co of the movie as well. You're making and I met her and there was alcohol involved too. I'm sensing a theme here. And and <laughs> maybe, maybe Liam, there was a bit of typecasting there because the baker was was actually saved by his ability to hold his alcohol. So I actually, in honor in honor of your uh, character, <laughs> is why I have charged up for our Happy Hour podcast. So oh, okay, here, okay. Here's yeah. to you, I'll cover, sir. I'll cover the brand. There um, we go. I'm just, yes, I just <laughs> have, I have a glass of water here, so because it's still only two in the afternoon here. No, but uh, hmm. Liam, you're making me think of, um, just my mind is going back to the bar at the Real Del Mar. Yeah. And all of us sitting there and this one evening, actually there was more than one, but because there were Irish, Scottish, English and a smattering of Americans, people would bring their, with their, bring their guitar and Brian Walsh who, from Gaelic Storm brought his pipes and he would just <laughs> regale us with these amazing and beautiful Irish medleys and then um i remember you and griffith got up one evening and sang my fan week because he's from wales and that's a very yeah. traditional welsh song you and Stuart would take the guitar and sing these traditional scottish songs because he was scottish and i remember uh, leonardo DiCaprio's um friend and assistant jonah he would look at us going how do you know all these songs how do you know all this music and it made me think of Imagining if we were really passengers on the Titanic and like the third class dance scene, yeah. that's how you pass the time. That's how we pass the time. You're making me recall a very funny moment. 
one evening, uh, Yohan was called upon to sing a solo song, and he had a beautiful, Yohan Gruffin, that is, uh, he had a beautiful played, Welsh voice. You played voice. third officer low, is that right? That's it, exactly. Alive that? Anybody alive? Anybody alive? Anybody alive? Anybody alive? <laughs> <laughs> we, we of course, he was also That's Reed him. Richards in the Fantastic Four with the stretchy arms. Uh, yeah, yes, and, he's and he a was lot, um, uh, 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 Horatio Hornblower. Uh, um, uh, but uh, Yohan was called upon to sing. Now he was sitting with his back to the reception desk and everybody else was placed in the seats facing the reception desk. And just about as he was about to sing, I got a phone call. So I went up to the reception desk to take the phone call and I'm chatting away and I'm, I'm been asked from Los Angeles, well, how's it going down there? Blah, blah. I said, we're having a great time here actually. Yohan is about to sing a song, uh, can you hear him? And I did this with the, the, the phone and no, didn't hear a thing. Well, try this. And I pushed it a little further, you know? No, I still can't hear a thing. And well, what about this? And I did that with, with the phone line. And next thing, the phone line, the phone and the receptionists all together came across the desk trying to catch it. And everybody sitting opposite the reception desk was trying to keep a straight face because they just saw the most hilarious moment they'd seen since they moved down there. And there was Yon just merrily singing the song, not knowing or not realizing that this was going on behind his back. So if only we had a video of that. I, I was going to say, I wonder, you speaking about that, you know, now, now everything is documented through our phones, but I... I wonder, was James Cameron the kind of director that might have been savvy enough to say, hey, once you enter the set, turn over your phones or lock up your phones or no phones on set? My well, the, well there were certainly no phones, but also there was this huge sort of thing where you did not take photographs on set of, you still yeah. shouldn't take photographs on set. It's like an unwritten law hmm. that you don't, you don't take photographs. But I did, many of us had little disposable cameras. Remember those? <laughs> yeah. Made out cardboard and plastic. And I had one concealed in my muff. And my... <laughs> Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> Very personal. <laughs> and and it was it was quite handy. And my makeup uh, girl, wardrobe girl, she's like, let me pretend like I'm taking a continuity photograph of you. And that's how I have those very few images sitting on the set with a crane behind me or or a few moments because we really had to be very discreet about photographs taken and then, you know, hide the camera somewhere. Uh, but yes, if we had phones now, I, I mean, I don't know how they stop people taking images. There must just be a security person all the time going, put that phone away, put that phone away, delete that image or whatever. But anyway, back to you, Liam, and your extraordinary character that everybody knows and remembers because you have that 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 triple shot, frame shot with you and Kate and Leo at that most exciting moment, just as the the ship is about to vertically sink into into oblivion. Um, tell yeah. us a little bit about that process, about that day or those days and nights on that poop deck. Well, there were just uh, it was amazing. Um, Kate actually came up to me on the set and said, "Listen, what's it like up there?" Uh, she hadn't been up on the back of the deck at this point. And uh, as people who watch your your excellent documentary will find out, uh, Simon Crane was the one to introduce me to it uh, and it told me it would go to 90 degree angle. So uh, I was up on the 90 degree angle and I was strapped in, harnessed in on that. And uh, I, I it, after a few moments, it got quite comfortable. I, I was okay with it. And I explained that to Kate. And I said, actually, they have stuntmen either side of us. So you'll be quite safe. They've got these stunt guys who, who act as, as extras that will safeguard you and help. And the second she heard that, she said, oh, that's fine. That's fine. And off she went. And she was delighted. And there was no problems after that. Um, now, up on the back of that 90 degree angle deck, there were some really hairy moments, as you probably remember. And um, I, I actually had a, a great... Um, a, a great moment in there that Bill Paxton, Lord Reston, came up to me and he says, you know, you've got the funniest line in the movie. And I said, I have? Yeah, everybody's saying that. And I went back to Jim Cameron, I said, you know, when we were about to shoot that line, and I said, um, 
you know that everybody said you wrote the funniest line of the movie for this part. And he said, okay, uh, uh, did you bring your clown nose with you? And I said, okay, mm. point taken, Jim. <clears throat> so I got to say the line, went to the movie, and the line was gone. And the line was, take turning to me, and I look into the abyss below us, and I turn back and I say, hell of a night. And I walked out of the premiere that, that night of, of Titanic, and I bumped straight into James, James Cameron, and he said, uh, he said, oh, how are you doing? Thanks for turning up. And I said, oh, hell of a movie, Jim. <laughs> And he laughed and he said, no, when we showed it to test audiences, they found it so funny at such a dark moment, we had to extract it. So uh, I lost that wonderful line, you know, as a result of that uh, on the back of the film. But something else I did get in there was um, uh, an incident. I, I gathered Alexandra wants me to read something from the diary. So I, I use that as a segue, if, if you like. And that was um, in, in, during the, the actual uh, shoot itself, I walked up to Jim Cameron one night and it, it was a scene that was not actually in the original script, but because of what I did, um, I ended up having a little nod to my late dad, whom I absolutely adored. And uh, during the shoot, I approached Jim Cameron Clutching, I'm um, reading from my Titanic diary now, which you probably see when you go to watch Ship of Dreams in the Titanic diaries. And I approached James, clutching a whiskey flask, and I said to him uh, that I had a genuine prop for my role. Pointing to the flask, I told him my father left it to me in his will and his father to him. Ergo, it would date back to the Titanic sinking to that time. He, James dismissed it, said that he said, oh no, the baker would never get drunk on the fifth. And I said, ah, Jim, but the alcoholic would always have a bank to back up. He gave me a little knowing smile after that and just waved me away. So little did I realize that it would be sooner rather than later that this would come back because that particular night, the, the wind kicked in. And because it, it was a sinking in icy waters, um, <clears throat> Jim was sort of freaking out and he says, we've got to keep shooting, we've got to keep shooting. And he looked at me and he said, Liam, your hair doesn't move. I tell you what, hop up on that railing there and um, you know, just hang on there. Give me a couple of stunt men. You jump over, you jump over. They jumped over 90 feet to 100 feet of a drop onto cardboard boxes. And then he said, Liam, uh, you, now you, you go and jump. And I looked at him bit in horrified and he says, no, no, just go to jump, change your mind, turn back into the railing, reach into your pocket for the flask and take a swig of that up as well. So when I eventually saw it at the cast premiere, I realized that there it was left intact, intact my little homage to my late dad, whom I absolutely adored, his flask in Titanic. Worth a fortune to the Titanic. Yeah, and then Zach mine. Douglas... Zach Douglas was already trying to take it from you in the in the Q and A yes. from our screening, wasn't he? he was... Yes, I'm still offending his 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 his, his offers. I'm just um, considering all the various offers that are coming in for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I joke. I just. It, I know it's worth it's worth it's you know it's it's worth a lot these these props and well especially it's something to you actually has it has no price because it was your father's and you've just managed to make a lovely sort of personal underscore to its its use yeah. in the film um but yes we we learned during uh, shooting ship of dreams titanic movie diaries just how valuable some of these props and costumes have become i believe kate's pink sinking coat has uh, just gone on or it will go on auction in a few weeks time and it's starting price is fifty thousand dollars so oh yes ooh, even and there are multiples of those <laughs> yeah, there are multiples of those but uh, um nelson you have a question i have a question for liam because there's that such a memorable shot when the ship is making its final plunge and, and we see the, the stern go under, but we see your figure, 
we see the the white uniformed chef sort of you know legs akimbo uh standing on it just as it as it goes down it's such a it's such a memorable shot uh, Liam, was that actually you? Was that a digital recreation of you? Tell me about what you I, filmed. I think, I think he, 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 he sort of finagled that to make it look like I was there with that going down. Um, like they shot the sequence and then just, you know, doctors is but in. But did you do? Did you stand in front of a green screen so they could put you on the on the on the ship, or was oh, that yeah. just all digital? No, no, they had me do all, they did various versions on the actual poop deck itself, 90 degrees in the air, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a separate studio where they, you know, faked the whole thing with green screens. So it was multiple takes, various different ways of shooting all that sequence. So they were quite easily able to feign the, the actual event itself, uh, adding in all the water and all that in post-production. It was no problem. I actually didn't get into the water at all until the Carpathia rescue sequences. So I was never in the water for anything. What, what didn't we see in Titanic that you filmed, Liam? Well, the Carpathia rescue sequences, uh, there is sm some of them are in the, the actual cut that's out there, but the, the, the deleted scenes, had me walking behind Ismay, having been rescued. That was deleted from the master cut. And also, there was a wonderful scene, which I was so sad to see taken out, uh, where the baker, realizing um, he, that there weren't enough lifeboats, decided he'd start tossing out deck chairs. So they shot that sequence. Uh, and actually, um, David Warner and Billy Zane are marching up the deck chasing after Jack and, and Rose and looking for them wherever they may be. And they bump me out of the way and I just give them a look and I pick up deck chairs and I toss it over the side. And then I take a swig of a different uh, uh, container of, of whiskey on that particular occasion. So all of that was shot and it's in the extras that are in the 10th anniversary release of Titanic, uh, all those deleted scenes, it's, it's contained in there. Um, the, the 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 fans are calling for a full on full fat version of this film. They would sit and watch six hours of that. Oh film, yeah, you know just to see question, every, yeah. and of course they're all very familiar with the deleted scenes as well. They've pointed my deleted scene as out to me, and um, <clears throat> which is it's always fun to to find those pieces. But uh, no, they are desperate for the the first the first cut which would be all of everything linked together which is probably about five hours long um uh who knows who knows what the next iteration of titanic after the 4k 3d that we've just had in cinemas i think there's a rumor that there's a 4k uh, blu-ray coming out for the collectors yeah and john lando was asked about that the other day in fact and he confirmed it and then he said oops maybe i should have checked the disney plus first or whatever well they have to but do it he, now he, <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, hey, and, Liam, and, because yeah. uh, because you uh you played a, a a real life character you you the baker was not a fictional character what other than what you may have read about him have you had any any real life encounters with his family, his uh, his descendants at all? Have you been motivated to try and find out? Actually, um, on Facebook and Instagram and the rest of them, Twitter and all those, there's a daily surge of people talking about Titanic. It's unending. And on one of on one occasion about six months ago, uh, some of the baker's relatives actually contacted me. Uh, I think they're a grand nephew or a grand niece or something like that. And they were so proud that he was their relative and they, uh, they were complimenting me and my portrayal of, the, of their relative. So I was chuffed with that one, I, to say the least. I was very, very happy with it. You know? Maybe you'll meet them at a Titanic convention. Surely there must be an opportunity for that. Yeah, there's actually one coming up in August in uh, Las Vegas. And they've been on to me asking me would I participate. So I'm actually in negotiations for that at the moment. And um, they want me to make a stage appearance and just sign a few autographs and that sort of thing at, at it, you know. And it's a, it's a massive crowd that's going along to it seemingly. 
And uh, I'm actually prepared now that you, oh, lovely segue, by the way, Nelson. <laughs> I'm That's actually what I prepared. Do. <laughs> I'm prepared for the event. Uh, if I can just show you the following. Ah, ah. There it is. The baker's outfit, the baker's hat. Doo -doo. And also- now that, can't, that can't be the one for, that you, you, that can't be your costume or is that a recreation? Tell us, no, where, a, where does that come from? A recreation, a recreation. And another recreation, another Titanic fan. His name is Stephen Proto, I think, I believe. And he's, I think he's got Titanic life belts uh, or some uh, site on, on Facebook and those. He's in and Oklahoma, he, I believe. Yes, I follow him. He, he yeah. sells Titanic reproduction life belts. They're beautiful. Like this one. Yes. But are they fun? Yes. I'm not, but yes, I'm being nice to <laughs> I wouldn't get it wet though. No, I don't think so. But it's just, it's, it's extremely Actually, heavy. on that note, you know that we reproduced some of your scenes with a stunt crew in Atlanta for the film because, you know, there was very limited amounts of Titanic we could use in a film. So we recreated a lot of it, you know, as you tell your memories. And um, I sewed all of the Titanic life belts. I started with one and I showed a photograph of Drew modeling it to my producers. And Nick goes, oh, yeah, can you make like seven more? I'm like, are you kidding me? Because, of course, every stunt performer had to have a life belt. I think I made about six and we kept swapping them around. But the but the inserts were sponges. They were like car wash sponges from Home Depot. Yeah. So they were actually very protective of them as they were tumbling down the recreated poop deck that we made. Um, no, I think actually <clears throat> tumbling down with those pieces of cork would have been quite uh, painful, actually. It's, well, I, well, I want to find out from Liam what uh, what life was like after Titanic. Obviously, it was one of the biggest movies of all time. So, you, you know, it, it does all sorts of things for you. But as as we find out in Alexandra's documentary, for some people, it 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 prevented them from future work. It it, it sort of worked against them. Right? You know, and, and in other ways, it propelled them to other things. So, Liam, what hap what happened to you professionally and personally? after Titanic? Well, actually, I did some work. I worked on a, a, quite a number of productions in that over the years, but um, I, it was a Murphy's Law situation for me. The agent I actually had at the time had been misbehaving uh, in her own career and had been uh, reported to SAG and to the Department of Labor and all that, and she lost her agency license. So at the worst possible time, I lost my agent. Mm. And it, it took me quite some time to um, get another one and sort it out from there. And also remember, people weren't as aware as they are now of Titanic and the impact uh, overall, you know, the, the overall sort of, uh, sort of blast that had out there was, was, was definitely return business with the, with the fans. But it didn't have the same impact on the business uh, as, as it does nowadays. I mean, anytime I meet anybody within the entertainment industry, oh, Titanic, oh, talk to me, talk to me. But it wasn't that, that wasn't the case back then. It was just to them another movie or whatever. So it took some time for it to, if, if you like, get its legend under its belt and become the the, 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 the the mammoth thing that it is today, you know? Well, I think, I think what you're talking about, and again, it goes back to our super fans in a film, is that they were all very young when they first saw the film. Like it made a yeah. very strong impression to a six-year-old or an 11-year-old or a 13-year-old. So it was not grown adults, shall we say, who in 1998 were swept away by this film. It was these very young people who thought they were watching a, a, a potentially a, a fictional story about a big ship that sank with this beautiful love, Romeo and Juliet love story. And then as they became more engrossed and more just passionate about this, they realized, oh my gosh, this is this actually happened. This was an, a historical event. Yeah. And it sort of expanded their experience and their knowledge of something that literally probably as a child started off just as another movie they would have watched. And um, Ilka Sophie talks about it. She's from Germany. She talks about it was the first film that I wanted to know more about these people and get inside these characters and just 
and everything. It was, it, it had an in, extraordinary impact on young people. And um, in fact, our co-podcast pre presenters, uh, Brittany Bul Butler and Ethan Brem have just done one of their episodes where she points out that the Nickelodeon Children's uh, Audience Award choice for that year was not an animation was not a musical or or a comedy it was titanic that yeah. all these young kids were absolutely blown away by that film and i think that's where that time factor you're talking about comes in is that it took them into their adult you know mature adult years for them now to be holding keepers of the flame of of titanic I was a yeah. lifelong Titanic person. Alexandra, less so. I mean, we, 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 through our friendship, we expanded your Titanic enthusiasm. Liam, where did Titanic fall in your, in your life? Where, before the movie version in which you starred, were you a Titanic enthusiast? Did you know the story? Had you seen A Night to Remember? I, I did, and that was my biggest mistake, actually, not re-watching A Night to Remember. Um, because uh, I was trying to be true to the character and not do my version of Cheap Baker Jacques and, and not, um, it, it was Charles Rose, I believe, was the actor in The Night to Remember. And I didn't want to- It's marvelous. Like, marvelous. Yeah, I didn't want to like go in and sort of be compared to what he was doing. So I decided not to watch it. And I was sorry afterwards I didn't because I'd forgotten much of A Night to Remember because I'd seen it uh, as, a, as a child. Uh, back in Dublin, um, and I should have gone back in and looked at it again and realized the, the great contribution that he made to the movie. And I, if I had done that, perhaps I may have had a different approach to Titanic's director, James Cameron, and said, listen, you need to show him a little more doing this and baking the, bake, the, the, the cakes and, and serving at the table and things like that. It would have given him a presence which is lacking in, in the version that's out there. You only see him for the very first time when Kate falls down and he picks her up and he says, I thought you miss. And that's the very first time you see the baker uh, as the ship is sinking. Uh, and that's where I feel it was remiss more of me, not of James Cameron, but more of me not to do that extra research and go into, go into James Cameron's door and say, listen, I think you need to, just a suggestion but I think you need to establish the character a little more because he he told me that he wrote J Jack and Rose and the sinking of the ship, their characters out of what happened to Baker. So basically that's what you're looking at. It's three divided into one person situation or one expanded out to three, really, I should say. Well, because he could imagine that very dramatic moment of the, the three of you and their their presence being the last people off the ship. And of yeah. course, it leads perfectly into the, um, not the door, but the piece of um, panelling that she's floating on and so forth, yeah. uh, which is also based on um, a Chinese sailor who was rescued because he was floating on a piece of wood and he was rescued into the lifeboats. So, you know, he, you have to give James Cameron some, quite a bit of credit of sort of borrowing those true stories, enough of them to fold it into what he put into the fictional side of the story. Um, so Liam, you said, you know, we, we saw you, you know, go down with the ship, uh, and and you you just told us about how uh, you filmed a scene where you were rescued onto the Carpathia. In between that, did you film stuff in the water? Like I don't I don't recall seeing you in the water. You may have no, been one of the no, flailing people. Absolutely what? not. Um, there was nothing. The only time I was ever in the water was the very last thing I shot while working on Titanic. In fact, and uh, it was a, an approach to the upturned lifeboat. So we had to wade through the water to get to the upturned lifeboat. Uh, there was the late Bernard Fox, Colonel Gray, uh, Archibald Gracie, whom I miss, I dearly oh. miss that man. He was a wonderful person in my life for many years afterwards. Uh, and we became a very close friend. We were and best TV fans. fans remember him as Dr. Bombay for all those yes, years on Bewitched. Very much so. And he was on that. 
also uh, Lightholler was on it, and also Craig Kelly who played the officer, the radio officer. Uh, um, and uh, we were approaching, I always remember, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but we were approaching the upturn in lifeboat, wading through the water, and uh, I heard a thump, splash, you know, and I looked around to see Jim Cameron dunking Craig Kelly into the water. And I just cracked up laughing, and Craig goes, flutters at me, and he starts pointing at me, and I gave Jim Cameron a look. And he says, yes, I know what that look is, Liam. And I do remember the baker never got his hair wet, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went down to film that little sequence, you know. What a You're intriguing me now. anecdote to end on. That was just, that was perfect. Craig got dunked and you didn't. <laughs> because history showed, history showed he never got his hair wet. Yes, and that's what he claimed in the court findings when he was in uh, at the inquiry following the Titanic. He said that he stepped off and just, just it eased into the water, never got his hair wet, and there wasn't even a proper splash or anything. The water just took him in there as the ship sank. Oh, Liam, thank you so much. My gosh, I know with all our guests, we could sit here all afternoon and just tell story after story after story. And we might, once we've been around everybody, might have to start again and bring you back and hear about <laughs> your story. I want to find out more about your friendship with Bernard Fox. That's uh, because Colonel Gracie wrote his own account uh, after the after the, the disaster. He had a published account uh, from his point of view. And uh, I want, but I do want to hear more about your friendship too. Yes. My yes. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film limited.